Um, so I'm from APFL, which is the Swiss Federal Institute of Technology back in, uh, in Lausanne. Does anybody here in the room know EPFL? <laughs> okay. Um, so APFL is the MIT of Europe. Okay, now you... <laughs> And one day, MIT will say, oh, we are the EPFL of the United States. <laughs> um, but that th at least that's the wish of, um, of my former president. So EPFL is an engineering school. I think in all modesty, we can say it's one of the good engineering schools in, um, in Europe. It has been uh, going uh, really up uh, in the rankings for the past um, few, I would say, uh, ten, 10 years. And uh, we have uh, the chance to work with some of the best um, engineers, uh, I think, uh, in Europe, in the world, as students. Um, so, actually, I'm going to give you a much less technical presentation than the presentation from uh, Derek. Uh, I hope at one point that he would say that his antenna system is free for our students, but I, I'll have to, um, to send him an email about, about that. So, the other thing I need to say is that I'm actually at the College of Humanities. So, the College of Humanities is a small school within an engineering school. And this is rather important, and you're going to understand um, why in a, in, a few, um, in a few seconds. So the talk today for me is about IoT, of course, um, but it's about IoT and education. So uh, a lot of the talks are about companies, uh, but all these companies are, of course, staffed with engineers. And uh, these engineers, at one point in their life, uh, were at the university or at the in engineering school. So um, what I have noticed by working at the school for the last um, eight years, actually, was uh, our engineers are good. They are very good. They tend to be very, very focused. Uh, if we were off the record, I would say they are autistic, but um, they tend to be very, very focused. And uh, one of the things I, I wanted to do with them was actually to try to broaden a little bit the perspective. And uh, so in 2014, uh, I had been taking um, business students to China for many years to try to open their eyes about uh, the rest of the world. Because as you know, uh, Switzerland is a very small uh, country in the middle of Europe, so we don't have any energy except maybe water, but um, the, our only resource is basically uh, brain and the money of others. Uh, but um, so a, a couple of words on, on EPFL. So we are based in uh, Lausanne, where the IOC is, and we have a bigger sister, which is ETH in, um, in Zurich. Um, basically, we have the chance in Lausanne to have a very good engineering school, to have a good business school, and a very good design school. So when in 2014, the head of Swiss Next China came uh, into my office at EPFL and said, I want to do an innovation camp in China, I said, oh, let me think about it and let me try to do something which actually broadens the perspective of our students in all these three schools. So, um, I'm an economist by training. Huh? I do code, and I, 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 but I, I'm not an engineer by, by training. So, being a very naive um, economist, uh, what I said, I said, okay, let's put in the same team engineers, designers, and business students, and let's ask them to build a connected device. It should be easy, you know? So I went around, and, um, and that's when being at the College of Humanities matters. If I had been in the School of Mechanical Engineering, or IC, or whatever, all the other departments would have said, no, 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 you cannot do that, no? Being at the College of Humanities, they said, oh, well, go ahead, you know, it might, might be interesting. So basically what I, we decided to do is we decided to form teams with students um, who have, so we have teams of six students, Three engineers, two designers, and uh, one business student. So the designers uh, are UX designers and industrial designers, so they can actually design a, uh, an application, and the industrial designer can do a shape, or uh, the, they do the industrial design. Uh, the business student is in charge of the business model, uh, the value proposition, because you can have the best engineers cook up the best products, but if there is no sustainable business model, it's gonna go uh, nowhere. And of course, you know, it's hardware, and hardware is hard, so uh, you know, we need some, some good competence. So basically, uh, the teams um, have this mix of competences, and one student can actually have several competences. So some of our guys are good maybe at microengineering, but on the side, they actually also code. So that's, that's uh, the concept. The project is called uh, Chic. Um, China Hardware Innovation Camp, we call it designed in Switzerland and manufactured in China. And I'm going to run, th run you through the, the concept and also some of the, the learnings and why it's linked to competitiveness uh, one way or another. So the remit is to develop a connected device. 
Okay? And uh, the first year, we uh, said, okay, we're going to do it using open source hardware, open source software. And we can do all of this in Switzerland, but again, I wanted it, the students to see a bit uh, the rest of the world, because most of our students, when you tell them to develop a connected device, the normal one, they're going to think of the Swiss market. And as you know, Switzerland is rich, but it's very small. The very ambitious ones are going to think about Switzerland and Germany. Okay? But none is going to think about China, India, Africa. Okay? So for us, it was very important that they can do stuff at home, but at one point you need to take them somewhere else, which is just going to blow their mind. Okay? So I had been in touch with Eric Pan on the other side of the border at Seed Studio, and uh, he said, you're welcome to come and uh, do the prototyping back in, uh, in, in Shenzhen. Uh, I'll price you at cost, but it has to be open source. And so um, the, the first year, the students actually published everything on GitHub. Um, everything was really um, open source. One of the interesting things that happened at the end of the first year is that the students presented the, the result to the deans and the vice dean and the vice president of the schools. And the, prof the professors and the deans said, oh, but there is a lot of IP here. We have to protect it. And one of the very interesting reactions from the students was, some students said, ah, oh, you're right, we spent so many hours developing this, it should be protected. And so next year, we're going to do um, proprietary stuff. Some other students said, if it's not open source, I won't do it. And so what, what we found interesting is that what we asked the students to do, the business students, is to come up with business models, which can basically have either uh, proprietary or uh, non-proprietary or hybrid business model. So again, we can live with any kind of, um, of, of models for the, for the students. So the, the key concept is to go from idea to prototype in 30 days. So that, that's the slogan I, I had the first year. At the end of the first year, it was from idea to functional prototype in uh, 30 days. Because what we realized is that when you have students who develop a, c a connected device from scratch, after you know, 30 days of work, you basically, and 30 days, and I'll get you there in, in a couple of minutes, but it's actually over a full uh, semester and a bit more, so a bit more than 14 weeks, but one day per week. You, you, you don't get to a 100% functional prototype, especially if it's the first time you actually do it. Okay? And then um, it's 30 working days, because as I said, it's uh, over a long, uh, rather long period of time. Now, I'm, I have to run you through a number of pedagogical concepts because I think that's the link with the competitiveness and why we need to train our engineers this way. The first thing which I think makes the program different from other programs around hardware or, or even interdisciplinary work in, in engineering schools is that our pro program is actually bottom-up. Most of engineering programs are top-down. The faculty basically tells you're going to design us a new device doing this, that, or we give you components to do a robot. What we do in uh, October, we bring the students in the classroom. They actually don't work in teams at that point, but we have the right mix of, of students. We give them a white sheet of paper and we tell them, now you design whatever connected device you want. Okay? And um, at the end of the weekend, so it's two days of intensive uh, work, uh, usually they don't have a real idea, but they have a universe. So this year, for instance, uh, one group wanted to work on humanitarian relief, one group wanted to work on autism, one wo group wanted to um, work on a turbo nap device so that you could sleep quickly and, uh, and wake up. This one didn't go anywhere. And the last group actually wanted to work on a, on a hat that um, measures uh, your UV uh, exposure. So bottom-up project proposed by, uh, by students. This has a tremendous advantage is because you get a lot of ownership from the students. They actually propose something and they work on it and they know why they're doing it. So that's the first big difference. The second difference from other projects I would say is called double interdisciplinarity. Schools, I, I know some of you have left school some years ago, some maybe even many more years ago, but universities are a bit like companies, they have silos, no? It's very hard for them to communicate from one department to another. There is maybe jealousies, maybe the time schedule are not aligned, uh, of course sometimes the fields are not aligned. So simply by having mechanical engineers working with micro-engineers, we already had done something. Now having these guys actually work with designers the artists of the world, in a way, for them, was something. No? And then they had to work with the business students. So suddenly the engineer, who was very focused on designing a, a new PCB, had to think about cost. 
Okay, he was thinking about, or she was thinking about technology, but now he or she had to be thinking about, about cost. Okay, so that's, again, now you can imagine the complexity of organizing a curricula around three schools and different uh, faculties or departments within a, a school. But there, again, um, I think it's, it's an I interesting part. Real world, real learning. Very often we have our students in classrooms who do stuff which is completely disconnected with the real world. Okay, so what we said is, you want to do something, but you're going to have to do it as if you were to launch, launch a startup. Now, we don't want you to launch a startup, because that's not the point. Anyhow, 90% of the case, you would fail, no, statistically. But we want you to take through the whole exercise of going from the blank page to something that is functionally uh, viable, okay? So real world, real learning. Then immersion. As I said, uh, in academia, and I did spend quite a, a bit of my <laughs> young life uh, in academia, but I also worked. And I can see the difference between being in the real world and in, in academia. And again, most of our, of our curriculum back in, in our universities, especially in the good ones, is geared towards theory. Okay? And we are we're making very good engineers, very theoretical engineers, but very often these guys, they actually want to do stuff. And they want to be already in, uh, in the next step of their, in their career. So, Having spent many years in, uh, on the mainland and in Hong Kong back again when I was a bit younger, I said, why not do it between Hong Kong and Shenzhen? This is a fantastic ecosystem where the two places are actually are very interconnected on certain aspects, a bit less on, on, on others. But let's take them to Hong Kong, understand what is to be done here and also what is to be done on the other side of the border. So we actually, once they have done the prototype, uh, end of beginning of, uh, end, end, end of May, beginning of June, they do their exams, and then we fly them over to Hong Kong. We stay at Hong Kong University of Science and Technology for a couple of days. We do stuff here, we pitch at Brink, we uh, go to Maker Hive, Maker Bay, so they understand a little bit the excitement that you can have in Hong Kong in terms of innovation. And then we go to Seed Studio on the other side of the border to finalize the prototype. Okay? So, and I can tell you that students from a Swiss engineering school who come to Hong Kong for the first time of their life suddenly have little twinkles in their, in their eyes. For some of them, we're actually putting Hong Kong on the map because they have never heard of Hong Kong, okay? And they have never heard of Shenzhen either, by the way, but okay. And the last aspect of our program is that we also know that when you're at the university, most of the time, you care about the exams, no? You study for the exams and then you pass the exams and as soon as you've passed the exam, you have another exam, so you quickly forget the, what, you, you, what you have done for the first exam. And so we do spend a quite significant amount of time to actually make the th students think about the journey. It's not the product at the end that actually matters. The fact that the device goes to the market or not is really not the question. The question is, what, what mistakes did I make? What successes did I, uh, did I encounter? What did I have to de develop as an engineer to suddenly be able to interface? So Steve mentioned interoperability of systems and devices. I'm in the business of interoperability of people. Okay, so how do I get engineers to talk to designers and business students? Because that's going to be the, the, the thing they're going to do next. No? So these are the, the five key elements of, um, of the program. So how does it actually play out? We have an ideation weekend at the end of October. We select the projects. We actually bring people from the real world inside the room when the students actually pitch uh, the, the projects. Then we have exams and stuff, so that's not for the program. And we, s we actually do the kickoff mid-February, and that's when they actually start prototyping the device. And then every week they have, we have a list, uh, we have detailed, uh, what the, the various competences have to do, not the various students, but the competences. And at the end of every month, they have a milestone. Okay, so basically you have uh, the breadboard at the end of milestone one, you have a semi-functional PCB at the end of milestone two, you have your first PCB at the end of milestones three, then we come to China, and then we you know, promote uh, what the students have done when, um, when we go back. So that's basically uh, the concept. Now I'm going to give you a couple of examples of what the students have done. This is a con uh, an example from the first year, because this year is the third year we have done it. Okay? So this was a smart baby bottle. So basically, uh, the students were thinking about connecting a baby bottle. And um, in that team, there was a Chinese student, uh, actually from Tsinghua, the Beijing campus. Um, and the students, she said, oh, you know, the biggest problem my sister has is she wants to measure the temperature of the milk and how much the baby drinks. So I said, okay, go ahead, you can do this. This. They had a mechanical engineer, they had a micro-engineer, a uh, material engineer, and a business student in, in, in that team the first year. 
Now, they went out in the streets in, in Lausanne, in Switzerland, and they asked people, what do you think about this baby bottle, one that measures the temperature and one that measures the quantity of, of milk? And everybody laughed at them. You know? They said, to measure the, the milk, you put it on your hand, okay? And to see how much the baby drinks, usually on the bottles, you have little gradients, okay? So you know damn well how much. So these guys, this team was sort of destroyed when they had done the customer journey, okay? But I let them do it, okay? And then they came to China. And one afternoon, we were at Foxconn in Shenzhen, okay? And they had to pitch again. And there, the reaction was, how much does it cost? We want it, okay? So there's a completely flip between the reaction back home and what the customers actually wanted here, or on the other side of the border in this case. And again, this is for us, the journey we want to take our students through is that they would have never thought of develop that there was a demand somewhere else in the world, okay? It's only because there was this Chinese a student on the team that it actually happened. Now, how did they actually go from the white piece of paper to this baby bottle? So they did a bit of ideation. You have here the designer who did a bit of, of, of sketching. The mecha At one point, the, the mechanical materials engineer said, oh, maybe instead of measuring the temperature, and let's say now the, the baby bottle blinks, maybe we could have some alloy at the end of the bottle which actually has memory and closes if the temperature is above uh, or could burn the, the baby. But then they actually aban abandoned the idea. They did the schematics, they did the 3D renderings, the PCB schematics, and they finally produced uh, the PCB, okay? And so that's the product, oops, and here you have the inside of the baby bottle, okay? And so I'm gonna take you again through a number of things. We also, of course, ask them to do um, an application to interface with the device, okay? So you have somebody, you have the UX designer who basically not only designed the experience of the person who holds the bottle, but also the experience of, of, of working with, uh, with um, the, ab the application, okay? And um, one of the, there are two very nice stories about this, this project. The first one is that at one point, they were thinking about how are we gonna measure how much the baby drinks, okay? Once you take away the gradients. And so the engineers, the good engineers from APFL, they were thinking for one week, for two weeks, for three weeks, they looked at lasers, at different things, how to measure how much fluid was going through the baby bottle. And one day they came back to the classroom and they said, uh, oh, we found it. We're gonna measure how much the baby bottle w was weighing before and how much it weighs afterwards. And I said, okay, which engineer actually came up with this solution? And they said, oh, it's not the engineer, it's the designer, okay? So again, what we, what we found interesting in this case is very often some of the solutions to the problem statement which is given to the students by themselves in a way comes not from the source that you would expect it to, it to come. The second thing that happened, that was like four months after they had worked on their project. We were in Shenzhen. We got um, the casing, um, and um, then we got the PCBs, okay? So they did the pick and place, the PCB was ready. It was ready to be inserted in the casing. So this team had been working four months together, and suddenly I hit it. I said, what's happening? For four, as you see, the attachment here is not in the center, okay? For four months, they had not discussed between themselves on which side, it, if it was gonna be this way or this way, okay? And they had designed it wrong, okay? So they had not talked to each other. And so that was, for me, the best thing that can happen. Because if you do such a mistake you know, at university, that's perfect. Okay? And you will never do it again. So for me, I'm very happy when they make such kind of mini mistakes, even if, if we had you know, to redo a bit of, or they had to do a, redo a bit of, of designing. But that's exactly what we are actually looking for with this type of project, you know, is to take them through this development process, through this journey, learning a new language. L for an engineer to learn the language of a designer, I tell you, it's rather difficult. When they sit in meetings, well, sometimes they get kind of bored, you know, or they simply move back to designing the schematics of, um, of their stuff. Now, how do we actually make sure that we get from a white page to this? We have developed a number of things. We have, for instance, developed um, weekly uh, Trello cards, and again, we, the students are assigned to, uh, to this. And we don't look at if the students follow the Trello cards, but they only know that after four weeks, they have the first milestone, okay? And so th this is some, some students, some teams actually like having this micromanagement in a way. Some just hate it and they don't use it at all. But again, uh, each card is then attached to a resource. So basically, 
Um, maybe if it's in the phase of ideation, you have a resource related. Here you have the competence, so we actually provide the knowledge on uh, an electronic platform so that they, ca they can actually link the task they have to do to some uh, back-end um, system. And um, here I, uh, and then there is a website, okay? And so in, in this reflexive um, approach, we ask the teams to actually blog on a weekly basis the advancement of the project. It's good for them because then they have to basically publish and basically come out with what has worked, what has uh, not worked. And of course, it's good for my sponsors who can see that something is happening. So these websites, these were projects from last year. So again, interesting story. Um, the one in the middle is a self-heating uh, Tupperware. So basically, you could um, heat it. Uh, I mean, you charge it, you put your food in it, and then with your uh, device, you basically hit your phone, and your food is ready 30 minutes later. Okay? They came, so in Switzerland, they liked it a lot. In Hong Kong, they said, but it's not, never going to work. You know, we go out to the restaurant, or it's not good to eat by yourself. For us, eating is some sort of a, you know, social uh, gathering, so it's very important. And again, it's so important for the students to understand that even if it's tried to say so, but people don't consume the same way on the other side of the world. This team was about doing a connected um, helmet. Uh, basically, which uh, tells you to go left or right on the basis of what uh, you have entered in terms of uh, the, your, your direction. And the last, um, there's a fourth one, but AMO was the last uh, project which was really interesting. This is basically a lock you put on your mailbox or any type of mailbox, and you basically can give the encryption key to anybody. Okay, so basically at the university we have kind of lockers, they're not very well used. Uh, somebody maybe has the key for the whole year but never uses it. So a better use of this would be simply to have a lock. You get the encryption key to open that. Maybe you want to pass something on to somebody else and you just give him or her the encryption key for that lock for a, a limited amount of time. So again, in Switzerland, great idea. Some investors were actually interested. And then they come here and they see plenty of Alibaba boxes on the other side of the, uh, okay? And uh, yeah, such a big disappointment. Huh? And so again, for us, the message is, you took four months to develop this. Why didn't you go on Taobao or on Google to simply see if it existed? So think about it. But again, um, the, the designs are nice. The, the, the hardware inside is, is, is really interesting. So as you can see, it's really not the, the objective is not to market these products. The, pro the objective is really to take them through the, the gears of actually doing it. And um, do I have another? No, I don't. So, once we, we have done that, uh, thanks to, so the initial sponsor was Swiss Next China, which is sort of our um, science and research arm to promote Swiss scientific endeavors uh, worldwide. And thanks to um, a, a nice uh, grant from the Geberhof Stiftung, we said we want to scale this idea and basically open source the process to other institutions uh, worldwide. So the first editions, we had 50, 15 students. The second one, we had actually uh, 60 students interested, and we selected only 24 or 25. Um, now at the school, it has become a minor, so it actually the students get a lot of credits to do, uh, to do the project. And so now we move to this China Hardware Innovation Platform, where basically the idea for us is to say, if you have three institutions, one design school, one engineering school, or a business school, or if you are a university which has this among uh, your own university, we are willing to basically give you the processes, everything we have developed so that you can do it between yourself um, in your school. We can help you, of course, to uh, insert it into a curricula, run some workshops, uh, design how it works, but at the end of the day, for us, it's really maximizing the impact so that students worldwide, so we started now in, in Switzerland, so we, are, we went from four teams to seven teams. We're now thinking about rolling this out in, um, in France and in, in other places. And it's also why I'm actually in Shenzhen with Tsinghua, because that's one of the ideas uh, we, we have in mind. So it's open to Swiss academic institutions for now, but we are moving to, uh, to Ivy League institutions. Why did I put Ivy League institutions? Because again, hardware is hard, and uh, it's not really easy, even over a semester, to actually go from a white sheet of paper to, um, to a connected uh, device. So if I was to summarize uh, the talk, uh, Chic is about being project-based, uh, interdisciplinary, multi-site, so Switzerland and, um, and Hong Kong and Shenzhen, and most importantly, student-driven. Um, we 
our philosophy is that we are now at a phase in education where we have taught students to, to solve um, closed project and there are many things that are changing around us and we need to actually prepare them to solve open-ended projects um, both actually at high school and at the university so for us it's very important that the students don't learn the right answers but that they learn to ask the right questions and this is one of the things we're trying to do to, uh, to do so. So last but not least, yeah, the sponsors. And again, when we come to Hong Kong, we actually, so we, we stay at USC, but we also, and that's where I met Hen Henry, we also take them to the Science and Technology Park to see maybe some of the students could come if they want to, because whatever they do, if they want to pursue it afterwards, they can. The IP is theirs. Uh, the school has, is giving up, giving up any IP. So we also want uh, sh to show them what Hong Kong offers, and of course, what uh, Shenzhen offers on the other side. But it's very nice to have the, the support from uh, the Hong Kong community on this type of, um, of project. So thanks again for, for having me.